Welcome back. In this video, we are returning to China during the Sui Tong Song dynasties from 581 CE to 1279. As a result of watching this video, you should be able to answer these four big questions. First, in what ways did the cultural traditions of China change during the Sui Tong and Song dynasties? And in what ways did they stay the same? So a CCOT question focusing on cultural changes and continuities in China. In what ways did the political traditions of China change during the Sui Tong and Song dynasties? In what ways did they stay the same? So another CCOT, but focused on political continuities and changes. What are the innovations that were developed in China during the Sui, Tong, and Song dynasties, and ultimately how did those innovations spread? And then in what ways did China exert influence on other regions in East Asia? So the first big question, in what ways did the cultural traditions of China change during the Sui, Tong, and Song dynasties, and in what ways did they stay the same? So the last time we were in China, we were talking about the collapse of the Han dynasty as a result of both internal factors like the Yellow Turban Rebellion and social inequities and divisions, and then ultimately external factors like the invasion by the Zhanu, those northern nomads. So China became decentralized again after 220 CE with the fall of the Han Dynasty. It reverted back to this decentralized collection of wealthy aristocratic landowners. Now, if you recall, during the Han Dynasty, we talked about how Confucianism was the ideology that addressed the issue of it about how to create order and stability in society. And with the collapse and fall of the Han Dynasty, many people began to question the values of Confucianism and its effectiveness at achieving order and harmony in society. And this really is going to open the door during this period where northern nomads are already coming into China. It's going to open the door for a new religion to take root in China, and that's Buddhism. So Confucianism is going to be in decline during this period, and then Buddhism is going to begin to take hold during the Sui and then in the early Tang dynasties. But a lot of what China was learning about Buddhism was second or third or fourth hand as it was passed along the Silk Road. And so a Chinese traveler named Zhuang Zheng left China and traveled all the way to India. He brought back with him to China some Buddhist scrolls and some statues of the Buddha. And in doing so, he increased China's knowledge of Buddhism. Zhuangzeng is one of the these famous interregional travelers of this period, along with Marco Polo and Ibn Battuta. So Buddhism, why does Buddhism take hold? And when you think about this question about why Buddhism takes hold, it's an interesting one, right? Because China is a society that's really built on their own traditions and customs. And Buddhism is really foreign, emerging first from India and spreading along the Silk Road. But what Buddhism offered to China was something they really didn't have, right? It offered salvation, that idea of nirvana, that anyone, regardless of their position, could achieve the final goal, the salvation. It also offered opportunities for women, right? Monasteries started cropping up throughout China, and women could participate as nuns and could find opportunities which they weren't necessarily afforded to them in traditional, more patriarchal China. Now, whenever you have a new religion moving into a region, it oftentimes begins to blend. There's syncretism, and that's exactly what happens in China. So existing ideologies like Confucianism and Taoism begin to meld with Buddhism, and eventually we see the reemergence in the Song dynasties of Confucianism, and this is known as Neo-Confucianism or New Confucianism. So during the Song Dynasty, Confucian scholars began incorporating more spiritual Buddhist and Taoist ideas into their teaching, right? That's this sort of syncretic blend between these various ideologies. As a result of the reemergence of Confucianism, China increasingly became more patriarchal. We see this, for example, in this image. So this and some other scenes that I showed you in the intro are from a famous painting called Along the River during the Qingming Festival. It was first painted during the Song Dynasty, and it shows the average everyday life of Chinese during the Song Dynasty. But one thing to note about this is there are about 840 individual people that are reflected and shown in this image. And to the best of scholars' abilities, they can only discern about 20 of those are women. 
And the reason for that is because women's role was not to be out in public. Another major transformation in gender roles in China occurred during this period with a practice that became widespread, but started really amongst upper-class Chinese women, and that's the practice of foot binding. Yeah, so you can see how at a very young age, around age four or five, women's feet were bound with very painful, tight bindings to prevent their growth. And really the origins of this, it's fascinating. There was an emperor who had this thing for this palace dancer and she had very small feet. And so what really started as one emperor's bizarre foot fetish becomes this practice that is going to continue in China all the way into, essentially it ends during the 20th century, but a practice that is going to have a long lasting, huge impact on Chinese women. And so when we think about this from a physical standpoint, this physically prevents women from being able to walk and move. And so this basically is going to confine them into their home where they were expected in fulfillment of their traditional gender roles. So in what ways did political traditions of China change during the Sui, Tong, and Sung dynasties, and in what ways did they stay the same? So with the collapse of the Han dynasty, we have this three kingdoms period. Ultimately, China is reunified in 581 by the Sui dynasty. So there's this reemergence of centralized rule in China with emperors claiming the mandate of heaven, right? Remember, the mandate of heaven is that authority that is given to centralized rulers in China, and that's where the emperor gained legitimacy and power was through those ancestors. So this should sound familiar to you, the, the emergence of the Sui dynasty, right? Following this period of disorder. So notice these two periods here, right, of decentralization, the warring states followed by a very short um, centralized period of the Qin, and then the Three Kingdoms period followed by a short centralized period of the Sui. So the Sui dynasty is going to not be around for very long. It's going to be replaced by the Tang dynasty in 618 CE. The Tang replaced the Sui. Now the Tang's capital is moved to Chenang, which is further west, but it's along this route right here. So it's along the Silk Road. So Chenang was a capital and it was the center for Silk Road trade. In Chenang, you could find all of these various diasporic communities. So there would be Christians and Jews and Muslims all living in Chenang, all engaging in trade. During the Tang Dynasty, China experienced a long period of stability and prosperity. This is really considered one of the golden ages of Chinese history. There was also a lot of political upheaval, though, as evidenced by the rise of this woman. So her name was Empress Wu. So Empress Wu arguably became the most powerful woman in world history after her husband died of a stroke and she was able to outmuscle her sons taking on the title of emperor now recall this is in a society china that is highly patriarchal and this very much flies in the face of those confucian ideas of women and their subservience and so not surprisingly empress wu was one of those women who were embracing Buddhism, right? Because Buddhism was offering some opportunities to women. And so here we can see a statue from the Tang period of Buddha, but it's believed to actually depict the face of Empress Wu. So during the Tang dynasty, the civil service examination system was restored. So this would be a continuity from the earlier Han dynasty. So the civil service exam system was a test again that was given to determine positions in government. So those bureaucratic, those scholar officials were chosen based upon their knowledge and ability. And if you recall, the test was based on Confucian principles. So Confucius, again, during the Tang Dynasty is back. So what is this? So this was an incredibly grueling exam. And so people tried many different ways of cheating, including using this cheating vest with answers written on it. So you, if you think students today are the only ones that cheat, well, can show you that cheating has happened for thousands of years in history. So at the start of the Tang Dynasty, the exam was only open to the upper class, the aristocracy. But as time passed, the Tang allowed more commoners to test, which created more of a meritocracy. If you think the AP test is hard, 
these test takers would have to stay in this small little cubicle for essentially two days. The only thing they got in their room was this board and a pot to pee in. So a meritocracy is a rule ultimately by officials based upon ability and not birth. And if you study world history long enough, you see that those governments that are most successful are ones that essentially establish meritocracies that appoint people to positions of power based upon their ability and not, not their birth. In 960 CE, the Tang Dynasty was replaced by the Song. Now, one of the problems that the Song experienced was, as a result of having the civil service exam system open to more people, they built this very large bureaucracy. There were lots of scholar officials, but they lacked military training and military experience. They were very book smart, but didn't have that military experience or edge. And that's going to be important because the people who are going to come in and conquer the Song are the Mongols. So we're going to stop it there, but as a result of watching this video so far, you should be able to answer these first two big questions. In what ways did the cultural traditions of China change during the Sui, Tong, and Song dynasties? And in what ways did they stay the same? And in what ways did the political traditions of China change during the Sui, Tong, and Song dynasties? And in what ways did they stay the same? So in the next video, we'll pick up and answer those last two big questions. As always, thanks for watching.